Welcome everyone to this service of Evensong as we continue our celebration of Easter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus you, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. sit for the psalmody.
Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing, as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you, so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here ends the second lesson.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. On page 17 of the booklets, you'll find details of the schedule of services for this week. On Tuesday, the Eucharist at half past 12, with lunch afterwards, Choral Evensong at 6.15 on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday of this week is Ascension Day, and we have our service on top of the chapel tower at 12 noon. The choir will sing the service, and the tower will be open from half past 11. And then at six o'clock in the evening on Thursday, a choral Eucharist for the Feast of the Ascension, and we're delighted to be joined by our friends at the University Church on that occasion. And then over the page, you'll find details of this week's organ recital and also Ollie's book group on Friday. It's wonderful to welcome as our preacher this evening, the Reverend Canon Dr. Jennifer Strawbridge. Jen is a good friend of the college 
She's the GB Caird Fellow in Theology at Mansfield. She's also the Canon Theologian at Blackburn Cathedral and one of the Wicamical Prebendaries at Chichester Cathedral. It's really good to be able to welcome you back to Merton this evening, Jen. After the service, everyone's welcome to stay and join us for a drink on the Cherry Tree Lawn. The choir now sings the anthem, which is a setting of verses from the Revelation to John. And I saw a new heaven, the music by Edgar Bainton.
please sit or kneel for the prayers. So let us pray. In our first reading from the prophet Zephaniah, the prophet speaks of a time when God will save the lame and gather the outcast, and when God will bring you home. So we pray tonight for all those who are far from home, those who have been forced to flee from conflict, from Ukraine, or from any other war. We pray for those who have physically suffered in war and those who have become outcasts through it. And we pray to God to fulfill his promises to bring peace and to bring his people home. God of peace, you sent your son into the world as the prince of peace the healer of the lame, and the one who embraced the outcast. Bring an end to war in this your world, we pray. So call and direct us that, following in the footsteps of Jesus and energized by the Holy Spirit, we too may be peace bringers, may heal those who are hurting, and welcome those whom the world has rejected. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Except the Lord build the house, their labor is but lost that build it. We pray tonight as we celebrate this day with our chaplain for all those who have sought to build the Lord's house in this place, strengthened and empowered by the call of God on their lives. We pray especially for previous chaplains, assistant chaplains and associates. We pray for all those who have sung and served here. And we pray for Simon's ongoing ministry and for those chaplains and associate chaplains who are still to come, that in the months and years and generations ahead, their labor may flourish and prosper in the sight of the Lord. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose gracious calling came to those who were ready to cast away their nets and follow your Son, and who commissioned them in turn to make disciples of all nations, send your Holy Spirit down, we pray, over your servants in this place and your ministers throughout your church, that their work and their shepherding should be the Lord's labor his only, his forever, the servants of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As this Easter season draws to a close, we give thanks to God for the resurrection of Jesus and for the message of hope which the women and then the disciples were bold enough to share. So we lift to God tonight all those people or situations known to us where the new life which Christ offers is needed, whether in the midst of illness, disease, death, relationship breakdown, discord, or any other kind of fracture. God of hope, your son's mighty resurrection brought great joy, new spirit, and new life to your servants. We ask tonight for a share of that resurrection life, for breakthrough from ongoing illness, 
for peaceful resolution, for new hope in the face of death, and for a joy that hath no end. In the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the silence of this place, as generations have done before and generations after us will do again, we offer now our own prayers before God. gather up our prayers in the words of the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Now on page 11 we stand to sing the hymn. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now you might think, these words of distress, devastation, and gloom describe how we feel about the arrival of fifth week of term. Or perhaps how Simon feels on his 50th birthday. <laughs> but these words are actually how the prophet Zephaniah, our first reading this evening, begins his prophecy. Like most prophets, Zephaniah is not a happy person. He sees like many of us still today, 
injustice all around him. He sees people acting like hypocrites. He sees people trying to do their best to be faithful, but being distracted and overwhelmed and struggling to remember that God is in control. And so he tells them of God's cosmic destruction. God is going to judge the world and it will be a day of wrath and distress and anguish and ruin. It's quite a message for the start of week five or the beginning of a new half century. The beginning of Zephaniah captures well those of us struggling to find joy and to have a sense that God wants to offer us new life in the midst of the changes and chances of our lives and world. So in this sense, Zephaniah is like most prophets. He's not happy, he tells us God is really not happy, and he does a very good job of exacerbating fifth week blues and midlife anxieties. But Zephaniah is also not like most prophets, because just at the point when there seems to be no room for hope, Zephaniah seems to find it. And not just that, he proclaims that things will get better, and then he bursts into singing. Yes, the world is a mess. Yes, God's people are struggling, but God is present in the midst of it, and this is cause for joy. Surprisingly, even with all of the doom and gloom and in the midst of fear for what the future might bring, Zephaniah is a happy prophet. Do not fear, he proclaims, do not let your hands grow weak, because the Lord, your God, is in your midst. He discovers that when God is present, he can be fearful, but still have joy. He can be distressed at the state of the world and still cling on to some hope that all things are possible, even when all things are not resolved. But what's even more shocking is it's not just Zephaniah who bursts into song, because he seems to tell us that God does too. Now here is where you might be a little bit suspicious that the chaplain chose this reading this evening to mark the special occasion we celebrate today. But believe it or not, this is the reading that the church has given us for today, and with apologies to Simon, it's about the whole people of God gathered here and beyond, and not just our beloved chaplain. Because Zephaniah promises even in the midst of all the stuff going on, God will rejoice over you with gladness, exult over you with singing on the day of a festival, because I, the Lord, will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. The people to whom Zephaniah speaks have had a really hard time. They have been conquered by foreign nations, they've been scattered, they've been distracted from God. They are consumed with anxiety and fear. And they've just been told that God thinks the best solution to all of this is to destroy the world. They're confused and hurting and anxious and they're longing for something different and some hope. And Zephaniah promises it. He promises that actually to his surprise, and maybe even to God's, God chooses not to destroy, but to be present with God's people. And that when God sees the good and the love behind the messiness and disappointment in our world, God rejoices in them, in us, and chooses life over death. Now you have to admit, this is a difficult message to wrap our minds around. And if you don't quite follow Zephaniah's swing from sorrow to joy and from stress to relief and from anxiety to calm, you are not alone and neither, and it's very clear, neither are readings this evening. Because Zephaniah's promise of new life still has looming in the background that disaster almost happened. Oppression still exists. Injustice still happens. People are still isolated and excluded. God wouldn't need to bring justice or embrace all of God's people if that was something that was already happening. The world is still uncertain and frightening, 
And for Zephaniah, God still needs to come and gather God's people and assure them over and over again not to be afraid. Zephaniah still needs to remind us why we need God. Whether we're worried about a new half century or distressed at this point of term or anxious about the future or feeling broken by the injustice around us, the prophet reminds us God gets it and God wants to be near us and he reminds us how much we need God. It is surprising how much such a message spills over into our gospel for this evening where again we encounter God's people distressed and disoriented. Their Lord has just been murdered on a cross, they have scattered, the body is missing, and we're told three times in this short passage that they are filled with fear. And yet here again, we move very quickly from what feels like a situation where the world has ended to a mixture of fear and joy and the promise that God is always with us. Within both of these readings, fear and joy and God's presence and new life all crash into one another. We often think that we only have access to the good things in life. We'll only feel less anxious if we could just step away from all the stuff and the messiness that surrounds us. And of course, that might be true. But what the prophet and the evangelist also tell us is that fear and joy sometimes go together. It's okay to be overwhelmed by new life and God's love. Like Zephaniah and those disciples at the empty tomb, we never know when we will encounter God in our lives or grace in our lives or love in our lives. And we can either go about with great trepidation, fearful of all change, or we can go like those disciples, knowing that we're not alone, or we can burst into song like Zephaniah. Because even when we don't delight in ourselves, we are promised across these readings that God delights in us. Even when we don't feel like singing, God bursts into song because of how much God loves us. And even when we are lost and bereft, God comes to embrace us. God's joy has tangible outcomes for us. Those scattered are gathered together. Those subject to shame and exclusion are adored by God. Those who feel their future is uncertain are promised that wherever life leads them, they are not alone. So whatever the struggles or fears that we carry this evening, be they related to fifth week or 50th birthday, or all the other weights of our world. In the words of our readings, do not fear. Because God rejoices over us with gladness, exalts over us with singing, and loves us. May we allow God to interrupt us in our world, to surprise us with new life as God surprises Zephaniah and those disciples. And may we rejoice not only in the birthday of our beloved chaplain, but in God's promise to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand to sing our final hymn.
May Christ, who out of distress and defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new risen life and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. In memoria eterna erit justus. Justorum anime in manu dei sunt. Domine Deus, resurrectio et vitra credentium, qui semper es laudandus tami viventibus quam in defunctis, agimus tibi gratias profundatore nostro Waltero de Merton, ceterisque benefactoribus nostris, Corum beneficiis hic ad pietatem et studia literarum alimo. Rogantes, ut nos sis donis ad tuam gloriam recte utentes, una cum illis ad resurrectionis gloriam immortalem peducamo. Be Christum, Dominum Nostrum. <laughs> 